I remember the first time that I flew on an airplane. I was actually 17 years old, and so some of you might have flown when you're really young, and others of you, maybe you didn't fly until into your adult years, but I was 17. And at that point in time, and even still today, I'm a little bit of a calculated risk taker, and so I'm kind of sizing this up, and I didn't know quite what the experience would be like. And so on the one hand, I was a little bit excited to try something new, but on the other hand, I was a little bit concerned because I didn't know what this would be like. And so as the plane started to pick up speed on the runway and tilt back and everything, I was enjoying it, but I was kind of bracing myself. And throughout the flight, I would find myself looking out the window just to make sure the wings were still attached and things like that. Like, no smoke coming from the engines. Everything looks fine. And my ears started to uh, build up with pressure, and I actually experienced a lot of pain on the way down. The descent was pretty fast coming into the airport. And so I was a little bit concerned about my first flight experience. On the other hand, I've seen other first-time flyers, and some, especially kids, I've seen kids put their hands up in the air like they're on a roller coaster. I mean, it, they're just along for the ride during takeoff and landing. And then I've seen people in tears, even grown people in tears, because flying is very anxious for them. Or because like one flight that we took off from Salt Lake in, as we came up over the Wasatch Front, we hit turbulence. And so 30 seconds into the flight, the plane started dropping and hitting and dropping and hitting, and you could see the worry and the concern. So people's reactions are a little bit different sometimes. And that's the way that it was with Jesus in the announcement of his birth. Some people were really excited, even had this uh, attitude of celebration. Other people were a little bit worried. Other people were downright competitive with that. And we see all those different instances today. Maybe it helps us kind of pinpoint where we're at as far as our response to Jesus in our life as well. And this is how this passage starts. We're in Matthew chapter 2 today, looking at verses 1 through 12 starts out this way. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem. So a couple of things that we need to get introduced to here in that, that upfront statement. First of all, is Herod the king. We'll talk about him in a moment because Herod the king has quite the, quite the background in the story. But the other people we need to get used to are these Magi. Uh, some Bible translations call them the wise men. The wise men, maybe that's how you've heard them termed at Christmas time. Uh, maybe they've been introduced as the three wise men or the magi or the three magi or things like that. And in, anyway, this group of people, they arrived from the east in Jerusalem. Here's some background on what I think magi were. This is based on history. There were several different ancient documents that talk about the magi or the Magians, and those are from the 5th and 6th centuries before Christ, so five, 600 years before Jesus. Um, Herodotus' histories, the Persepolis fortification tablets, the Behistun inscriptions, uh, the Old Testament book of Daniel, those are all these ancient sources. Not that you care about those titles, but this is something that's historical. And so they were a priestly caste or tribe of uh, Medea. You've heard of the Medes and the Persians, perhaps that empire, so the Medes. And they inhabited what was uh, now western Iraq since 1300 BC. And when Cyrus the Great united the Medes and the Persians, at this point in time when the Babylonian Empire got uh, conquered, they were brought in as priests and advisors. They were people who looked to dreams and they looked to the stars to give them interpretations and signs and information. And so in the book of Daniel, when you see these other wise men with Daniel and they're having these interactions, that's very probably who these people were that they were interacting with. And they performed a lot of religious rites and rituals. And eventually the Medes and the Persians were conquered uh, by the Greek Empire. And so they kind of headed from western uh, Iran to eastern Iran and joined uh, the Parthian Empire. And so for a few hundred more years, they were advisors. But again, they, they had this penchant toward the stars and dreams and kind of mystical ways to interpret uh, God's will for those people in those empires. It's a little bit of background on them, but they were very connected with government administrations in those empires. And it says this group of people said in verse 2, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? King of the Jews is not a Jewish way to refer to a king. They would have said the king of Israel. And so these were Gentiles, people from other nations, these uh, <clears throat> magi were. And so the question is, why would a group of people from eastern Iran be so interested in the birth of a Jewish king? Yeah, it seems like an odd thing. They perhaps traveled up to 40 to 60 days on a journey, um, maybe 1,400, 1,500 miles or so to find this king of a tiny nation when they were a part of this expansive empire far away? Why would they do that? I don't think the Bible tells us exactly. So we can you know, come to a few theories perhaps. 
I think it's possible that, again, hundreds of years before when this group of people, the Magi, had interactions with people like Daniel in the Old Testament, perhaps Daniel, perhaps some of the Jews that were exiled into that uh, Babylonian and uh, Mede and Persian empire, maybe they had some interactions. Maybe they shared their scriptures and their prophecies with this group of people. Or maybe Daniel even told these, these people, you know, in a few hundred years, they're going to look at a king coming, the king of the Jews. And this king is going to be more than a king. This king is going to be this deliverer, this savior. This king is going to be God. Maybe they knew that information. Um, maybe it was because this star appeared. And we know later on in the story, in fact, in the next statement, that there was this mysterious star. And they pay attention to uh, astronomy and astrology and the positions of stars and comets and things of that nature. And so maybe this thing caught their attention. And Maybe it was because in the Old Testament book of Numbers, there was a star that was associated with this prediction of a future Jewish king. Or maybe it was just because God used it to get their attention. Something in creation stood out to them, and they associated it for some reason with Israel. So they took a journey. Maybe God appeared to them in a dream and told them these things because they also looked to dreams to receive interpretations from God. Maybe it was some other reason altogether. We really don't know, but we know that they simply said, we saw a star in the east. We came here to worship him. So this is more than just a king who deserves recognition. This is somebody that they want to submit to or bow down to. They recognize this king is greater than they are. And we really don't know the story of how God got their attention. And sometimes God gets our attention in some pretty mysterious ways to draw us to him. And that was definitely the case. So it seems like they're kind of excited. They've got some anticipation. But the reaction of Jerusalem when they arrive is very different. They are very concerned. Uh, sometimes there's things in life that they should make us really excited, but they make us really concerned. I know when Christine and I uh, experienced the birth of our second child, our daughter, um, Capri, when she was born, it was a very exciting thing, but at the same time, it was very concerning because my wife had had gestational diabetes throughout her pregnancy, and so her blood sugar was always high. And as a result of that, Capri in the womb got used to lots of blood sugar. So as soon as she was born and separated from that connection to her mom, her blood sugar just dropped, it plummeted, and it was really hard. She wasn't eating well, and that blood sugar wasn't coming up, and the people in the hospital told us, you know, if we don't see improvement by the morning, she's going to have to be admitted to the NICU, and that meant more costs and more separation and more experiences that we weren't prepared to deal with, and so we were just really concerned. Thankfully, kind of at the last moment, her blood sugar popped up a little bit. We were able to get some, some milk and some formula into her to help with that. But we really didn't know, and it was kind of, uh, kind of concerning for us. And so while it was really neat to have a child, there was a lot of concern in those first few days. It kind of put a damper on that celebration. And that was the case in Jerusalem um, as well. This news of a birth of a Jewish king, it caused a disruption among the people, among the king in Jerusalem. And it happened for a few different reasons. I want to give you a little background as to King Herod and what his situation was like. He suffered from psychotic levels of paranoia, just to give you a little detail on his background. As a king, and he ruled for over 30 years in Jerusalem, he executed his brother-in-law for a conspiracy. When he suspected two of his sons uh, that they were plotting against him, he charged them with treason and had them executed. And five days before his death, his firstborn son, who was heir to the throne, in five more days he would have taken over the throne, he actually charged him with plotting against him, and he executed him right before he died. That was to tell you about the way that this king operated. And everyone in Jerusalem knew King Herod is unstable psychologically. He was not heir to the Jewish dynasty, one that had been in place for about the last uh, maybe 80 or 90 years before him. He wasn't the next ruler in line. He had been placed into his position uh, by Rome, by the government in Rome. The Senate put him in that position, and they took someone else out of power. And so he didn't really have a right to be the king in Israel. He wasn't even a Hebrew. Uh, he was an Arab. His parents were from uh, both south and I think a little bit further uh, southwest of, of the nation of Israel in its location, from a different place, from the country of Jordan and from kind of the south desert of Israel. So he wasn't even Jewish. He had converted to Judaism, so he practiced it nominally, but he wasn't really uh, religiously committed, as you might be able to tell from the way that he was acting and behaving, even toward his own family. And so all these things uh, came about. He was very unstable, and he was hated by the Jewish people. There was a, a Jewish historian who wrote in the mid-first century. His name was Josephus, and this is what the Jewish people thought about King Herod. 
He was not a king, but the most bar- barbarous of all tyrants. The Jews found him to be such uh, by the sufferings that they underwent from him. So he caused them to suffer. He says, when the very great number had been slain by him, those that were left, they had endured such miseries that they called those who were dead happy men. And then goes on to talk about what they did to those people. And so he was a very cruel king, and he put down any opposition with execution, essentially. And so the Jewish people hated him for it, and he hated the Jewish people. He was very paranoid. And so they were concerned because this king now had a little bit of a rival who had just uh, just cropped up, just sprouted. Also, when the Magi came in town, the Magi probably were not alone. I know we see nativities with uh, three different uh, Magi, on, maybe on a camel or something like that, and we think these three guys just rode across the, the desert you know, and came into Israel by themselves. History tells us there were three. The Bible doesn't put a number on it, but they probably most definitely were not alone. They were probably advisors, again, with the Parthian Empire. The Parthian Empire was separate from Rome, And they stayed separate from Rome. And you can imagine if they weren't conquered by Rome, they had a fair amount of power, right? Because Rome was conquering everyone at that point in time. But the Parthians were able to hold their own. So they probably came in with with Parthian military because they had treasures with them. And it would have been unsafe for them to travel alone, especially as uh, dignitaries from this country. And so they were probably really well accompanied. We can think that as well because Herod doesn't try to take any action against them. If there were three people and he thought maybe they're a threat or maybe they're a cause for concern, he probably would have just you know, stepped in and all of a sudden they wouldn't have, wouldn't have existed. They would have disappeared. But that wasn't the case. And if the Parthian military accompanied them, the town probably also had another reason to be concerned. About 30 years earlier, the Parthian Empire had tried to gain a foothold over Jerusalem when it was controlled by the Roman Empire during a period of Roman uh, civil war. And so perhaps Herod thought, they're coming back again. They're trying to take over this region, you know, or maybe this new king who's been born will ally with them and will have problems. And so his paranoia is taking over. So this excitement of this possible Messiah, it's probably dampened by an uncertainty of how everybody's lives are going to be impacted. Is Herod going to go off his rocker again and start slaying people around Jerusalem? Is he going to perceive them as a threat? Are we going to be at war? What's going to happen as a result of this? And so there's all these unknowns that leave them with so many questions and so many concerns about this future king. It says in verse 4, Gathering together all the chief priests and scribes, he, Herod, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. So Herod, Herod's kind of pursuing this more. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what's been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for from you will come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So the scribes and the priests, they open up their their scrolls of the Old Testament books, and they point to this prophecy that says this ruler, this expected king, and they haven't had a king in Israel for over 550 years. But it's this future promised, predicted king who'll be more than just a king. This person will be born in Bethlehem. And that's what they tell Herod. And that's even more concerning. They determine where the Messiah will be born. But Bethlehem is really close in proximity. Herod has two places where he sort of has a stronghold at. One is a fortress and it's right uh, on one of the walls around the temple in Jerusalem. And that's only five miles away from Bethlehem to the north. And Herod has a palace And it's only two and a half miles away from Bethlehem to the south. And so this new king, this new threat is right in the middle of Herod's home turf, really close. And so he feels this urgency, this need to do something about this, this competition. And that's really another way that people view sometimes Jesus is as competition. When I was a senior in high school, there were about seven or eight of us in my high school class. There's about 400 people. And we were all kind of at that point really focused on academics. Um, Since I've kind of let loose a little bit, not to say that I try to slack on things, but I realize I'm not perfect and I don't try to pursue that even with my my studies like to the nth degree. But in high school, I was kind of perfectionistic and so I wanted wanted to do well, I wanted to keep a high GPA. And there were about seven or eight of us that were in line for valedictorian in the sense that our GPAs were all the same and they were all fairly high. And so there was going to be one thing that would determine who would come out on top and get to do this valedictorian address or speech, and that was our SAT scores. So we all took these tests, national tests, and at that point in time they were scored, 1,600 was the highest that you could possibly get. 
And so we all kind of anxiously awaited our results because we were competitive with each other. And so I got my results, and I was fairly happy with them. Um, and so I went and I, I shared that with a couple other students. One student in particular, uh, she and I had been competing for the last six years to see who would get the best scores on tests and all these things. We'd shared a lot of classes together. And so I went up to her and said, hey, how'd your tests go? And she asked me how mine went. So I told her my score, and then she told me her score, which is about 50 points higher than my score was. I was like, well, I guess I didn't, I didn't get that one. Maybe she'll be the valedictorian. And then we went to another one of our classmates, and she said, well, I got a, I got a 1590. I missed one question on the test. So all of us just looked at each other. You know, there goes any of our chances. So, and she was so, so perfectionistic. She tried to take the test two or three more times to ace it and never, never got more than, I guess, never got a perfect score on that. But we were competitive, and we almost didn't view each other as friends at that point because there was competition that was involved. We want to be better. We want to put the other person down in that sense. And Herod had an extreme sense of competition when this revelation of a new Jewish king was given. It says in verse 7, he secretly called for the Magi and determined for them the exact time that the star appeared. And so he wanted to estimate the date of this new king's birth. He's doing a little research because he has a plan up his sleeve. And it says he sent them in verse 8 to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. So he's going to use these magi. He realizes they'll lead me to him. If I just tell him, you know, come back and let me know. And the next statement, he actually says, uh, when you found him, report to me so I can come and worship him. And anything everyone knows about paranoid King Herod at this point says this guy's not interested in worshiping this new king. But that's what he tries to sell to these magi. He wants to find the child's location. He deceptively expresses this desire. I've got the same desire you do to worship this baby, to see if the magi will lead them directly to him. But he intends to destroy the threat through his throne. And we'll find out in a week or two what he does to try to destroy this new king. It doesn't work because God's a step ahead. But that's his intention. He wants to eliminate the competition. He's done it before, a few times, and he's going to do it again. And I think maybe that's a temptation for us as well. Not that we want to strike down Jesus in the flesh, but maybe we want to inf uh, eliminate Jesus' influence on our lives. Maybe we have our own kind of throne, and we like the way that we do things. We like the way we make decisions, and we don't want anybody else getting in the way of our plan that we have for our life. And maybe when we find out Jesus is this king, maybe Jesus is even more than a king, we start to get defensive and we feel threatened by Jesus because Jesus might ask us to do something differently than the way that we intend to do it. And that's a very possible reality as well. Or maybe we react like the Magi, which I would say is a great reaction to Jesus. And it's really one of celebration. They're excited. I mentioned my high school classmates a few moments ago, and we were competitive at that point in time, but we kind of moved past that. And we were able to actually celebrate each other's successes. And from that group of people that were so competitive for that position of valedictorian, um, their lives actually led them to some really great and interesting places. The friend that I competed with for six years over test scores, she ended up becoming an OBGYN, uh, went to Africa for a while to deliver babies there, and practices in the United States now. Um, one of my other classmates ended up going on Broadway. Another one actually worked for Wall Street for a while. Another one became a school teacher in her hometown. Um, and then uh, the girl that got the 1590 is now a, uh, a journalist who has her MD as well. Um, and I think writes for a lot of ma maybe even major publications around the world and goes on different TV shows to, to contribute medical information. So you never know where God's going to take you or those people. And so now we can look around and celebrate where God led different people. And I'm a pastor in a town of 4,500 people, Laverick in Utah, you know. So all of our lives look different. God led us in different ways. But we can celebrate that and celebrate the differences and the different opportunities that each one of us has. And again, I would say that's a good reaction to this news. He says in verse 9, After hearing the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star which they'd seen in the east went on ahead of them, till it came to stop over the place where the child was to be found. And so this star that, you know, who knows the origin of? Maybe it was supernatural in origin. Maybe it was a 
comet, maybe it was a planet, maybe it was an asteroid. We don't really know what the identity of that was, but God used that to direct these people who saw that as communication from him. They were looking for it directly to where they could find Jesus. And I think that's a key point too. They were seeking, and I know there's that phrase, wise men still seek him, right, that comes out around Christmas time, but I think that's a very true challenge for us. Um, there's a certain wisdom into seeking. Jesus said, um, you'll find me if you seek me with all your heart. Seeking you will find. And so there's an invitation from God to seek him. And seeking is a great start. Even if you're at a place where you have questions or you've had bad experiences with religion in the past or you don't know what to believe or you've been let down by your faith, seeking is a great place to start. And these seeking people, God reaches out. God gives them the direction that they're looking for. And God might direct you in different ways. He might cause someone to cross your paths. He might connect you with truths from him. Uh, he might connect you with information in some way. But God's going to put a star out there, something that you can follow. And they were directed right to a place where they could find Jesus and discover him and see more. It says, when they saw the, saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. So they were excited. They celebrated that. I've been looking for this. We journeyed so far. And it seems like for a time, maybe the star disappeared or something like that. But then it reappeared and they saw it and they, they realized, oh, we finally, we found what we were looking for. And they were excited. They celebrated. It says, after they came into the house, they saw the child. And this is Jesus with his mother, Mary. It says, they fell down and worshipped him. And so there's this recognition from them that Jesus is more than just an average human king. He's someone that deserves their submission. That word worship is an interesting word. There's a lot of words in the Greek language, the Koine Greek that the Bible was originally written in in the New Testament um, period. And it, there's a lot of picture words. And this picture word is one of, it actually means uh, like a dog towards someone. That's what the word means. And so what they were doing is they were approaching Jesus like a dog would approach its master. If you've owned a dog before, at least one that, <laughs> that enjoys your company, uh, maybe a, a golden retriever or something like that. Think of that type of a breed. But those dogs, they just love to please you. They are excited when you walk in the room. They come up and they lick you. And when you ask them to do something, you know, maybe, maybe they cower if they do something wrong, but a lot of times they take joy in pleasing you. They're submissive and they're respectful and they're loving. And that's the idea of the way that these, these magi approach this baby, this newborn king. And as people who probably had pretty high positions of authority in the Parthian Empire at that point in time, for them to lower themselves and actually bow themselves down, that's what it says, they fell down, so they prostrated themselves, they fell on their faces before this baby. And they recognized, this baby, I'm like the dog, and the baby, baby Jesus is like the master, and I'll submit. And again, that's a whole different level of approaching Jesus. They express their respect and submission, the same that a dog would show to its master. And again, I think they believe that Jesus was probably more than just an earthly king because of that reaction. They also devoted some of the best contents of their treasure boxes that they carried with them to him. It says they uh, opened their treasuries and presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Those are some of the hottest commodities at the time, and we'll find out next week why Jesus might have needed those things and Mary and Joseph might have needed those items uh, but they gave of some of the best things of their resources and their wealth. And I think that's challenging to us as well. If we've come to this place where we realize Jesus deserves my worship, then the next step is saying, what do I have to offer to Jesus? Finally, it says they continue to allow God to direct them. And this was through a dream. And again, dreams are one of the ways that they expected God to reach out and speak to them. And God warned them in a dream, don't go back to Herod. <laughs> He's got bad intentions. So they went a different way back home to their own country. And we don't even know what happened from this point on. But these wise men are a whole lot willing, more willing. These magi are a lot more willing to come and seek and find Jesus than the people who have been expecting him in the same cities, in the same communities for the last several hundred years. I think that's challenging as well. I want to kind of wrap this up with a, maybe a way that we can assess this and try to use it personally. I try to close things out that way. Here's a few things to think about. First of all, how do I react to the news of the birth of a divine king? Because we're reading this, and we're reading Matthew's account. 
And Matthew wasn't just explaining a history. He was writing to people after the fact, after Jesus already went through all these things and he experienced the life of Jesus on earth and he saw him ascend into heaven. Matthew's writing this for people who are going to read this book, for people in his generation, for people in future generations, for us. And so we're hearing this, and maybe even for the first time. So what's our reaction? Are we concerned about this new king who we learned last week is supposed to be divinity, God in the flesh? Are we concerned maybe about how we might be affected by this king's heart? Because we don't know this king very well yet. We'll get to know him in this book. Maybe we don't know about this new king's ambitions. When he grows up, what are his goals going to be? What are his policies going to be like? How great is his power? Will he abuse it? Or maybe we see Jesus as a competitor, a threat to our throne that will disrupt our rights to make our decisions and live our lives. It's possible as well. Maybe we celebrate his arrival and worship him. Or maybe we doubt that a good king is actually a possibility. How could a good king actually exist? Because we've seen so many examples of poor leadership or people abusing authority or absolute power corrupting absolutely or things like that. Um, Secondly, what are my concerns with giving Jesus the freedom to rule over my life? Maybe we are concerned. What are those concerns? I think it's good to come to terms with that just to do a little self-evaluation. Maybe we feel threatened by Jesus and just saying, what areas of my life do I have such a tight grip on that like looking to what Jesus wants, that feels threatening because these things are important to me or I want control in these areas. That's a reality. A lot of us face that and we struggle to let go or to let other people influence us. Um, Also, am I earnestly seeking truth or to be led by God? Uh, These magi were. They just wanted to find what the star is leading them toward. And eventually they did. But some of us were not even looking up in the sky. You know, we're not looking to God for a sign or for information or for truth. We're just, you know, we got the blinders on. We're living life one day at a time. We're not thinking about spiritual things. So do we really want that? Do we really want God to show us if he's there? Um, And then finally, if I've decided Jesus deserves my worship, because maybe you're there this morning as well, and you realize, you know, Jesus does deserve my worship, how am I going to humble myself and give my best to him? And a side question is, what does my treasure box contain? Because I guarantee you, if you go out to our minivan, you might find a lot of uh, fast food restaurant bags and kids' toys and books and clothing items, you know, but you're not going to find gold. You're not going to find frankincense and myrrh and all these wealthy things. But I guarantee you that we have something to offer God. And I guarantee you that you do as well. And maybe it is these different resources like these magi. Or maybe it's something totally different. Maybe it's the time that you have. Maybe it's a skill that you have. Maybe it's a prayer that you could offer. Uh, we all have a treasure box. So what's in yours? And do you want to offer God something from it? All these are things to consider, I think, this morning. Um, But Jesus, he's an unexpected king. Sometimes he shows up, and we're not looking for him. We're a little bit concerned. We're a little bit competitive. Maybe we're a little bit excited. God, I thank you for this morning and this chance to look into Scripture and and see how uh, you unexpectedly showed up. People knew that someday you would, but they definitely didn't expect it at the time. And maybe we have this feeling inside that someday you'll show up. but Maybe we don't expect you to do that right now in our lives. Or maybe we don't want you to show up right now in our lives because we got a few things to finish our way first. Help us to realize that you are a king like no other. You're a good king with a kind heart. You're divine. You're inclusive. You aren't expected. We can trust your heart. Show us more of who you are week by week as we learn about you in this study in Christ's name. Amen.